Hi, this is Zach Brooks with World Transplant Athletes. Tips and tricks by and for transplant athletes anywhere, anytime, and online. If you have a body with a new part, you can move. You are a World Transplant Athlete. As a two-time kidney transplant recipient and frequent participant at local, national, and world transplant games, I always wonder, how do other recipients take care of their health and prepare for competitions? Well. For me, there's only one way to find out, and that's to learn from the best and the most inspiring transplant athletes in the world. Today, I have Tamron Stevens from Australia. Tamron, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So you sent me your five tips, and I want to get to those in a minute. But before that, I have some warm-up questions uh, for you so people can get to know you a little bit better. So the first question I have is, which transplant have you had? I have had two kidney transplants two kidney transplants so when was the first yep. and when was the second uh the first one was 2005 and the second was just last year so 15 years apart wow well congratulations on your second um thank you you haven't really lived until you've had two kidney transplants right <laughs> yeah that's exactly right yeah that's not what you were thinking during the process i'm certain so the <laughs> I was thinking about living, definitely. I was thinking about living, but like maybe not. This is what I absolutely wanted to do in my life. Um, yeah. the second question I have for you is if you had to summarize your transplant journey in one word and you have two transplant journeys to choose from, which word would you give that entire experience? Well, yeah, it was hard to think of a single word because as I say, I've had two different journeys, but um, I can't help but pull my mind to the most recent one and thinking about the most recent transplant journey I would say that the one word to sum it up is hectic yeah Just yes all, all of the various appointments and schedules and all of those things absolutely and it all like unfortunately the fail failure of my first kidney happened quite fast and then you know getting onto dialysis happened quite fast then coronavirus hit then lockdowns hit then mid lockdown I get the call to come and have my transplant <laughs> Yeah. And you've been to the hospital a couple of times after that, right? Just to kind of check on things. Yeah, absolutely. A bit of a bumpy road into yeah. the new kidney, but you know, we're settling in. It's settling okay. in. Okay. Um, so the third question I have for you is what was your first exercise post transplant? Well, for me, the first true exercise was just walking. Um, I, you know, for, from my last transplant journey, I'd gotten quite into sport and I was really keen to keep moving again. But I was banned from most of the strenuous activities, as you can imagine. So I just had to do what I could. Again, as, as you probably know, and as most of people who've experienced transplants will know, immediately after transplant, you're on so much medication that can just knock you around. It causes muscle wastage and all that jazz. So I was really keen to move. I wanted to move as soon as I could to prevent that. Um, so yeah, it was just walking and it started to the letterbox. And then it started to be, you know, to the end of the street, around the block. And I would just slowly, slowly build that up. Yeah, and I remember my first um, exercise after my, my second transplant and I counted 100 steps in the hospital ward. And then the next day, 125. And to me, like those 100 steps and the tiles on the floor of the hospital were like the most important steps of my life. And I still look back at that yes. first um, day of like some of the most important training I've done in my entire life. So. Yeah, that first exercise post-transplant is so critical. So the it final is, question I have for you as a warm-up for, for this um, is in which activities and sports do you participate on a regular basis? Well, I participate in cycling on a regular basis, but um, if you're not into cycling, you might not actually realize that there's so many things you can do. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm a road cyclist, but also I've been really enjoying gravel and adventure riding doing some bike packing. I do track cycling, which is the one on the velodrome with um, no brakes and uh, you have, can't stop pedaling, um, cyclocross, and I've recently gotten into mountain biking as well. Wow, yeah, I, mean, I think you listed like seven different types of cycling. So it sounds like you <laughs> like wheels that go round and round in the same direction preferably. Yeah. Okay, or maybe- Anything that makes me go fast as well, I like that too. It <laughs> okay. makes you go fast, okay. So Formula One for you in the future. Um, well, maybe. <laughs> Okay, 
So um, I invited you today um, and you sent with me, uh, sent to me five tips for transplant athletes. You know, if you have a body and a brand new organ, you're a transplant athlete. And so I'm always thinking about a person who's waking up today somewhere in the world and they have that new organ, right? What, what is their life about? So you, you were really nice to send me five tips and I'm gonna go through those five tips and then we'll go back to the top and have you walk us through those tips. So the first tip you have for everyone is keep it fun. Number two is find your people. Number three, small and steady builds are the best. Number four, routines are great, but don't be afraid to break them. And number five, find your mental anchor. So I'm really looking forward to this. So back to the top, keep it fun. Why is that your number one tip for everyone? Well, okay, so that's number one because you know, when you engage in anything in the sport, especially, there's a lot that goes into it and it is inevitably a competition. So once you get into it and you start to decide to do it relatively seriously, you can get a little bit bogged down in that sort of training and I should be doing this and I you know, want to hit this peak level. It can become a chore. And I've experienced moments in my life where getting on my bike felt like a chore and it suddenly wasn't something I wanted to do anymore. So I say keep it fun and I say that first and foremost because you just you know that's what we're there for it's like any hobby you start sport because you love it you start sport because it's something you enjoy don't lose sight of that you know it is there to be an enriching element in your life not to be something that you feel guilty over so yeah keep it fun <laughs> okay great number one is keep it fun number two you wrote right excuse me find your people what do you mean by that yeah. Well, this one's a bit of a multifaceted answer. Um, and it, it really, the thought for that one came from two places. The first one, um, as a lot of people experiencing a transplant will probably know that the process is quite isolating. Mm -hmm. um, you, you struggle to engage with a lot of normal avenues in your life. You know, it might be work, it might be other hobbies. Um, I'm lucky, I, you know, I have family, I have friends around me, but you do, you, you lose connection with people. So re-engaging in sport or you know, engaging in sport in general is an opportunity to find more people, renew some connections, build some new connections and gather that community around yourself again. So that was the first thought there. Yeah. And I think when we were um, talking earlier, you were talking about uh, bicycle riding and, and chatting and having conversations. That's exactly right. And yeah, so number two is just that, you know, sport is an opportunity to find your people you know I've made some of the best friends I have um through cycling and if you if you're not a cyclist you might not realize that cycling is not a solitary sport you can go out for a ride on your own absolutely and I I do that but some of the most fun rides I've ever had are when you go with one other person or a bunch of people and you're just riding along you're chatting and you're all um you're know, enjoying it together the ride that you and I were chatting about was a recent one on a weekend where I went out with a bunch of about five friends yeah. Um, we were all a little bit, um, we'd come off the back of, you know, I'd come off the back of a transplant, some people were feeling off, some injuries. So we said, this is going to be a slow, rep, slow ride. You know, it doesn't matter how slow you want to be, we're just going to stick together. And it was just wonderful. You know, we discovered some new paths. We paused on these, um, Melbourne, where I live, has a really intricate um, network of mountain bike trails in the city. Mm -hmm. You just have to find them. So, you know, we yeah. would go find the trails we would pause on different features and cheer each other on while they had a go like it was it's just wonderful so yeah find your people <laughs> that's awesome yeah my, my favorite experience similar to that is I was riding my bike this is in Arizona and for about an hour and there was a fireman who I kind of knew generally we just got to talking and we ended up riding like two extra hours and I don't even remember what we talked about and I don't even remember how difficult that day was and there's a lot of mountains uh, in Arizona where I was Tucson but just the conversations people can have, like if you're not in cycling, it's really a wonder. Like if you see two people riding their bike next to each other in life, like the conversations they have might be some of the best conversations of their entire life. So yeah, find your people, you know, engage in swimming, whatever your sport is. If you find someone, you're going to be really happy. So the third thing you wrote- It really here, is like that. Yeah. The third thing you wrote here is small and steady builds are the best. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, so again, sorry, a little bit of a long explanation, but this one comes from kind of a lesson I learned um, recovering after big events like the World Transplant Games, and it's become um, something I remind myself of often, in that you know, when you're engaging in sport and when you're starting that especially, it's so, you know, you're excited. So you can dive straight in and often, you know, I've done it 
many times when I've had a break or coming off the back of a transplant case, you just want to dive straight in and you go big and you can end up <laughs> burning yourself out and you know, then forcing yourself, unfortunately, to take a bigger break and it you know, becomes harder to get excited because you, you're remembering that sort of fatigue and that pain. So um, I say slow and steady builds are the best because if you can just you know, build it up nice and easily, you're going to have a kind of it, there's going to be more longevity like you're going to be able to get keep um engaging in the sport and enjoying it um and this comes not just you know from cycling which is what i enjoy it's also yeah i have to do a bit of physiotherapy and stuff for my shoulder and with that i tend to do you know some strength and conditioning core work and stuff like that as well and you know, life gets in the way sometimes i don't do it for you know two to three weeks and i'll rem- realize that and i'll jump back in a couple of times thankfully I've learned from it it hasn't happened in a couple of years but a couple of times you dive back in you do you know your full routine immediately and <laughs> your stomach and your shoulders are just aching for the next week and all of a sudden you've stopped yourself from being able to do it again and it's just another setback to re-establishing that routine mm-hmm. so yeah I I would urge people to consider you know slow and steady builds just build yourself up um, and don't don't rush too much <laughs> Yeah, I think this is such an important one. I think this falls, for me, this falls under the category of what I call learning and relearning. So, you know, you can learn the concept of like building slowly to, you know, have maximum fitness, but it's so easy to forget. So you have to constantly remind yourself that like you need to slowly build up in order to get to that next level. Like you said, this three weeks off is not very much, but your body three weeks later is not the same body. So exactly start again, so this is... Um, probably falls under the discipline of being a lifetime athlete, especially a transplant athlete. Like you really have to always know that base mark and then go back to it if you've been away too much. So, wow, that's a really important one. Uh, The fourth- I think it's almost, I'm sorry. No, no, please, Tamron, continue. (laughs) I was gonna say, it's almost our signature as transplant athletes, isn't it? You know, we we will deal with setbacks here on immunosuppression. You'll get sick, you'll get a cold for longer than other people. You'll be out longer than other people and it's, yeah, that that rebuild, that setback, that rebuild. It's almost yeah, our signature. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. I think that's a good way to put it. Signature for tra- signature for transplant athletes. So the fourth <laughs> one you wrote here: our routines are great, but don't be afraid to break them. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah. So I mean, it, it's kind of funny to talk about this one coming off the back of the last one because it all is almost the opposite. Mm-hmm. But that's it, it's just speaking to the fact that you know as we just said, you know, there's setbacks in our life, life gets in the way. And if you've established a routine, it can't always go ahead when you plan it. Um, So this particular tip is just to say, if you can't do it when you've exactly scheduled it, that's okay, shuffle them around. My, you know, best example for this is the fact that back, coming back to my physiotherapy and my strength and conditioning, I like to do that in the morning. You know, I like to kind of get out of bed, pot around, eat breakfast and then do it. Like that, that was my routine. But recently for me, that hasn't been possible because I'm having to drive to blood tests and I'm having to drive to doctor's appointments in that early in the morning sort of thing. And I'm exhausted by the time I get home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's easy to just say I've missed my timing, so I won't do it. Mm-hmm. But you know, often I'm able to come back later in the day and do it when I'm feeling a bit more in that space. And yes, it's not my routine anymore, but I've changed it. And it's the same with, you know, bigger things, riding, if I've scheduled a ride for one day and then one day my body's just not feeling up to it and capable, if you get into that side of, I should be doing it mindset, I should be and keep pushing mm-hmm. sometimes, yeah. you can do more damage than it's worth. So again, don't be afraid to say, all right, well, this day is becoming my rest day. Next day, I'll do my ride. Don't be afraid to move around your routine. Yeah, I mean, I think that falls under, you know, like flexibility. And, and I think there's even some research, physiologically speaking, that if you break up your routine, some sometimes is actually better for you physically because your body needs kind of a change in things. Like even if you're doing the same core exercises, if you do them later in the evening versus morning, that's actually not a bad thing either. But I think this is a, another one that's sort of learning and relearning because you have to continue to remind yourself that it's okay to take a break or change yeah. up your routines. And that, but that's a hard one to learn and very, very important. It is. <laughs> And so the final one, I, this is the one that really struck me as the most fascinating of all of them that you wrote, find your mental anchor. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the wording for this actually came from a friend of mine who, who introduced it, but it was something I realized I'd been doing for a very long time. And when I say find your mental anchor, I'm talking about kind of find the thing that you can do that puts you 
in a sort of a peak performance mindset or a peak calm mindset. Mm. Um, so that could be anything for me when I'm riding and especially when I'm racing, it's a bit of a mantra going through my head and it just, it's keeping me centered. It's keeping me, you know, focused on the task ahead and feeling, you know, feeling powerful, feeling competitive. Um, but, you know, obviously when we're entering into sports, mm -hmm. whether that's a competition or whether you're walking into a sport for the first time after your transplant, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that you're dealing with, you know, a lot of emotions, a lot of anxiety, a lot of nerves, all those sorts of things, especially when you're going into competitive sport and you've got sort of a goal, um, you know, it, it can be hard to filter all of that out. So if you can establish an action, you know, whether it's, you know, clicking, whether it's how you put on your shoes or a little clap at the start of a match or a race, it can really help ground you um, and put you in that peak performance mindset. And it's something you actually have to train, something you have to um, work on to, to get that sort of association. This is something that my um, friend taught me. So, you know, think about it early, you know, think about what's something little you can do at the yeah. start line or before a match or game, whatever you're playing, that you can just do to settle yourself and get yourself into that peak performance mindset. Is that yours? Is that yours? Do you clap to get yourself in there? Have you, can you share? Every now and then, yes. I. I actually have a couple. Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, so, yeah, as I said, I have a couple. I've got some physical. I've got some mental. Um, when I'm riding, especially in a time trial, um, I have sort of a rhythmic dialogue that I will say to myself. And the, literally the mantra that I repeat to myself is, you, know, you are powerful, you are strong, you are powerful, you are strong. And it sounds ridiculous, but it's wonderful. It really works. Mm -hmm. um, and then quite often when I'm on the start line of a race, it will be not so much a sometimes it's a clap a clap is sort of my anxiety habit so if i'm like double clapping then i can get that nervous energy out it's less yeah. my mental anger and more my yeah shoe anxiety um but just how riding is you know sometimes it'll be just like a light tap on the side of my knee or something like that that just okay. gets me into the mindset yeah and i know when i do time trial races oftentimes um you know it's pretty painful because you're doing this one thing extremely hard you know the 95 percent level of your exertion and i often tell myself that nothing else exists in life because when it's so painful you think about okay how long until this is over i'm going to have some water i'm going to have some snacks like i'm going to lay on the grass like you, my mind goes to like all of the pleasant experiences i want to have and when this thing is over and then i but then i notice i slow down a little bit and so then i say okay nothing and then i have to tell myself nothing exists in life like I have to enjoy this pain because that's all life is. And that yeah. helps me sort of stay centered. Now it, it does, it's not in the middle of the race, but it's sort of somewhere in the middle because your mind can drift in, in multiple ways. So gosh, <laughs> yeah, mental anchor, that's I, the way you phrase that. Uh, I think that's so important. And, and whatever someone chooses, if, as long as it works for them, it's totally- That's exactly right. Right? Wow. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a really interesting one. Yours is um, incredibly interesting. It reminds me, you know, again, just some variety of things. I remember um, doing a drill uh, on a velodrome. So, you know, it's a short lap, but the task we had to do was catch the motorbike. So the motorbike was riding around quite fast and we had to catch it. And that's an intimidating task. And then the lady next to me all of a sudden goes, all right, it's a three lap effort. And I went, oh, okay. And, you know, just breaking it down into that, you know, manageable level rather than thinking oh my god i have to catch a motorbike it was like the perfect thing to do so yeah there's so many different ways of doing it mm -hmm. that's excellent wow this is a uh, really fantastic um tamarin so thanks for being a part of the show today and so for audience members out there log in to facebook.com forward slash world transplant athletes on a weekly basis i'll try to upload video podcasts like this to get tips and tricks uh, World Transplant Athletes, Tips and Tricks by and for Transplant Athletes anywhere, anytime, and online. If you have a body with a new part and you can move, you are a World Transplant Athlete. Tamron, thanks so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me.